Hey y'all, my name is Pete Croft. I'm one of the ultrasound fellows here at Mass General. I wanted to speak with you briefly, approximately 10 minutes or so, about the elements of the fascia iliaca compartment block and hopefully give you a better idea of why we're doing this here and what kind of uh, patient-centered outcomes we hope to see occur from this block. Uh, this is going to be dedicated towards our elderly population with isolated hip fractures, such as this patient. Um, as you'll see, and as you know, patients with hip fractures, especially our elderly patients, are difficult to manage in terms of their pain. They either have comorbidities that make dosing difficult, or they have an element of dementia which make their assessment very difficult. My old program director, and I mean, yeah, old, uh, Andy Perrin, uh, instilled in us the idea that the next study that shows that as ED physicians were good at treating pain will be the first. So I carry this sort of idiom with me. Uh, I think this uh, rollout or this module of nerve blocks and compartment blocks helps helps to augment that and make, make us a little bit better at treating pain. Um, so we'll go over the types of nerve blocks and compartment blocks there are quickly and show you why I think the compartment block is the best and it's the most reproducible and easiest to teach. We'll also talk about how much anesthetic to use um, and what type of anesthetic. So 2009, uh, this article from Greece shows a uh, significant decrease in delirium with a compartment block. So we know what decreases delirium. The studies have been done. That isn't the only one. But what other patient outcomes can we hope to improve by this block? This study was an RCT. It was done uh, here in America, and it showed a significant pain reduction for about four hours. It showed decrease in additional rescue analgesia needed from the patients, and it didn't show any difference in adverse events in terms of respiratory or pain or any other uh, issues that were uh, studied here. This study um, showed that, and this was also a compartment block, so this is the type of uh, block that we'll be teaching here showed that pain relief was superior in all groups at all times. It also interestingly showed a trend towards less oxygen requirements, although so this wasn't significantly uh, statistically significant. This was in 2007. So one of the papers above mentioned a three-in-one block. This is basically injecting your anesthetic and holding pressure distal to the injection for approximately five minutes. Should we do that? I don't think it's necessary. This, this study uh, com directly compared, and this was a French study, directly compared the three-in-one block to the fascia iliaca compartment block. Interestingly, they used radio contrast anesthetic and took radiographs and showed the diffusion of the anesthetic around your plex plexi, and in particular lumbar plexus, as well as the other nerves that you're hoping to anesthetize with this block and show that the compartment block is actually faster and more reliable than the three-in-one block. Really interesting study, one of, uh, definitely one of a kind, and gives some further evidence and proof of why that this block, while as you'll see it's easy to teach, is much more time efficient and uh, for all intents and purposes just better than a three-in-one block. This goes into what you'll tell your patients. So these blocks last about eight hours. Um, they, as this study shows, effectively control hip fracture pain, which we know, and they start in about 15 minutes. So I usually tell patients, you can expect to see some relief, and in particular families, if they, they are not uh, maintaining as well, or if the families are on board or there. Lasts about, usually about four to six, sometimes eight hours, but can start in about 15 to 20 minutes. So the technique. So this is important. So you, in, essentially, you're going to be in the area where you're going to put a crash central line in. You want to. You're going to identify your femoral bundle, which here is your your nerve is going to be lateral, as we know, then your artery, and then your and then your vein. Okay. The goal of this block is to aim for this muscle compartment, your iliacus muscle. You're going to hold your probe probe obliquely between the the ASIS and essentially the pubic tubercle. There's obviously a little sway room from patient, patient's anatomy here, but this is the general approach. The biggest thing I need to stress to the residents here, um, in particular with all ultrasounds, but this one 
is that you need to set up your room. So first, before you do anything, go into the room, find your nerve, find your compartment. Know that you're going to be going into a a compartment that's accessible, and you can get kind of estimate your depth when you go in and use your ultrasound. And then set up your machine. So I usually set up the machine opposite the hip that is fractured. So when I do the procedure, I'm looking across the bed at the screen the entire time. You need to obtain your materials. This is essentially all you need. So you need your lidocaine. You're going to bring up your small skin wheel where you're going to inject your bupivacaine. This is your spinal needle. Some people, skinny people, you can get away with smaller needles. Most of our patients are going to be larger, so you're going to use typically an 18 or a 20 gauge spinal needle that will give you uh, sufficient depth of the skin to anesthetize. And typically you need two 10 milliliters bottles of bupivacaine, 0.5 or 0.25, and we'll go over dosing in a second. Here's your 30 mil syringe. This uh, is another thing I want to stress is that this is a volume block. This isn't, you're not surrounding the nerve itself. Your goal is to anesthetize the compartment and in effect that will diffuse through, I mentioned before that study that looked at radiographic contrast anesthetic, but the goal is to anesthetize both the, or not both, but all three of the lateral femoral cutaneous, the femoral nerve, as well as the obturator nerve. Now, ideally that's the goal. I'm not sure if you're gonna hit them all, but that's why volume is so important. And in general, except for my very large obese patients, I tend to use about 30 mils of fluid and I'll tell you what I constitute that fluid with within a second. You'll need, need gauze. You can use a tegaderm to put over your ultrasound probe. Um, and this is your chlorpep prep that you use after you identify your area and make sure you're in the right spot. It's another pictorial. These are the nerves I'm talking about. This is what you hope to anesthetize. You're going to be anesthetizing in this general area and you hope for some diffusion both laterally and medially to hit the obturator nerve. This is another pictorial. These are the two landmarks, the only essentially two landmarks you need to remember and recognize is your fascia lata uh, as well as your fascia iliaca, which covers the muscle bed or muscle body. This is the most important fascia that you need to get through before injecting your anesthetic. If you don't get through this second fascia layer, you're not going to get appropriate anesthesia. Here's a nice representation. Here's your iliacus fascia here right on top of the nerve and here's your lata on top so on more superficial this kind of hypochoic hazy area is the muscle this is your nerve again you're going to be lateral so this is a right side of the patient and here's your technique here is you're going to be doing this in plane so you're going to actually see your needle coming right down into the compartment you can inject your fluid it doesn't ideally you want to be right up under the fascial plane but you can be in the muscle belly a bit as well. That's kind of the beauty of this technique and why it's so easy to teach. Again, you're far away from the vessel, so you can come lateral. I usually get this in the view, drag my pro over here, and I just catch the end or the edge of the artery, so I have this big space here to aim for when I do this. Here's the left side. So again, nerve, artery, veins off the screen. You're nowhere near it. You're nowhere near the artery when you do this. You're going to be coming laterally in plane. This is your lata. This is your iliaca. Pierce them both. Inject your fluid here in the compartment, and you'll be all set. So one of the questions we always get asked is dosing, and it's very confusing with 0.5 versus 0.25. Try to simplify it for everybody. Um, here's what the ASA guidelines, and there's numerous online. There's nobody has a great idea or knowledge of the maximum dose. The safest one or the lowest one that I typically use is a maximal dose of two milligrams per kilogram of bupivacaine. This is transcends all of these different articles. Um, Gropivacaine is in three megs, but we'll be using bupivacaine here. So this is what I'm doing. So even for your smallest patient, that's approximately 50 kilos, a really small frail woman, elderly woman, um, you can still safely by two megs per keg, you can still safely use 100 milligrams, and that's uh, 20 mils of bupivacaine, so that's two vials. I then add 10 mils of saline to complete the 30 cc flush that I showed you before in the materials section. Um, injecting this entire 33, 
30 cc bolus into that muscular compartment will give you effective anesthesia. If you have larger patients, you can use up to three vials of bupivacaine, which I do often with patients that are 100 kilos, 120 kilos, and uh, never had any issues with that. Um, in terms of protocol, go over this quickly. Do what you're usually going to do. Give your Tylenol, give your morphine, um, and then you're going to be doing your block. Uh, the important thing is to here, in particular at Mass General, we've met with anesthesia, we've met with orthopedics, and agreed to page them as soon as we're going to do this and to document our basic exam in our chart. Um, and they were very amenable to this uh, approach. So in terms of risks, quickly to go over this, uh, what's always tested on boards is local anesthetic systemic toxicity. My question is, when I got into this literature and uh, tried to read more about it, was whether this is a legitimate concern for us in the ED. So let's quickly assuage uh, your fears on that topic. Um, this is the data from, most of the data on all of these peripheral nerve blocks is from operating room procedures where they do continuous infusions, which is much dis or very discreet from what we're doing here in the ER, uh, which is an isolated peripheral nerve block without continuous catheter infusions. So in theory, less, less aggressive techniques. So in this study, thir about 13,000 patients over eight years with peripheral nerve blocks of all types. 18 of these had neurosymptoms, and I'll show you in a second what neurosymptoms were um, uh, were described as or defined as. Uh, nine, nine of them over, had symptoms that lasted six months. One patient uh, had a seizure, uh, and zero had any cardiac arrest or if, if issues with a local uh, anesthetic systemic toxicity in terms of cardiac arrhythmias. Neurosymptoms are defined, defined as any sensory or motor complaint. Uh, and again, I mentioned this, most of these patients were continuous anesthetic catheter infusions. And this was in 2012, Anesthesia Journal. This is the most commonly quoted study. It's from 2002, it's French. It's actually a hotline service. Uh, and this is what people refer to when they talk about last uh, or local anesthetic toxicity. There's no data or randomized control trials or prospective trials on it. It was uh, the data comes from this hotline service, and this was in 2002. Basically, they called and polled all their anesthesiologists around the country and asked them about their anecdotal com complications. All in all, there were four cardiac deaths in over 160,000 procedures. Um, none of these deaths they can directly attribute to the continuous cardiac or uh, the continuous uh, catheter infusion of anesthetic. Uh, my reading of this is, uh, I don't know if this data is, uh, can even be reported. I think that probably one uh, study reported it and it got uh, re-cited uh, over and over again. Um, zero of these were from peripheral nerve blocks. Uh, basically, basically, long and short, I, I think we can feel very, very, very safe giving uh, this medication um, uh, without any uh, concern for local anesthetic systemic toxicity if we're careful. The beauty of this block is that we're in a compartment and not surrounding the nerve and not near the vessels, making this even more, even, even less likely than these studies or anecdotal reports would uh, suggest. Um, just a reminder, you do, you will get tested on your boards for this, but this is a lipid, um, lipid emulsions will be the treatment of choice for any cardiac arrhythmias that you experience during these procedures. Um, this is just a slide I put in when I gave my talk to the residents, uh, just further elucidating or clarifying things that we typically do uh, that have significantly more risks than this procedure does. Uh, we give penicillin a lot uh, without knowing great history on allergies, and we give it a lot for tooth pain and clinical strep and 20 out of 10,000 will have anaphylaxis and two will die. Same with radio contrast media, uh, carry more risks than these nerve blocks tend to carry. So um, that's just a short little aside, but I think in general we can feel very safe doing this. Um, the only caveat here is with our nursing staff, we did uh, agree to have the patients have be on the monitor during the procedure, so during the procedure, and the, uh, which usually is about five or 10 minutes, 
uh, they can then be taken off. Uh, this procedure will need to be done in our urgent section, our acute section, or, our, or in our ortho room. Uh, if you have any questions regarding any of the dosing, materials included, or the data, um, simply shoot me an email and I'll be happy to discuss it for you or with you. Um, pretty passionate about this. I think it's going to be a good um, quality improvement measure for our patients, uh, especially this patient group. Um, so I'll certainly field any comments and uh, thanks for listening. Bye.